of course, is built upon the word. So that's where I want to turn now, to John chapter 4. Some of you, John chapter 4 is a familiar passage. Uh, It may be a favorite of yours. Uh, If you're familiar with it, I anticipate it would be a favorite. Uh, It's a fantastic text, fantastic story of what and what happens there. Some of you, maybe you're not familiar with it, and that's just fine. Uh, I hope by the time we're done, you feel like you have a handle on what the message is. But there is a lot to love about this text. I want to stop and pray for us as we turn to hear the voice of God together. Lord, you are sovereign over all things, sovereign over our hurts, our struggles. You are sovereign over our victories and our celebrations. We come today as a distracted people. We have many, many concerns, Lord. We are not fit to be sovereign. We are not fit to be all-knowing. Let us let it go now. Give us just the clarity of mind, the peace of heart, to all of the care that we have brought in, and those things are real, financial concerns, health concerns, our kids, our children, our futures. Lord, these are all real. But we're not sovereign, and you are. Let us let them go that we might be the one in the story of Mary and Martha that chose the better thing, to sit at your feet in these next minutes now. Give us faith to hear, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me read the first few verses of John chapter 4. If you have a Bible, you'll want to turn there. Uh, If you have your own Bible... I would encourage you to underline, circle things, make notes. If you don't have your own Bible, they might not like you writing in the church Bible, but I'll put in a word for you, okay? So John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria... And so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So John gives us some background information here we're not going to delve into, but he's leaving Jerusalem, and he's moving back towards Galilee. And the note there, so just summarize it this way, the conflict between Jesus and the Jewish leadership is growing. And so at this moment, the, the feast or the festival that Jesus had been attending, uh, they're, that's over, and they're moving back to Galilee. Now, if you know the geography, at least as it's printed in your Bible map, in the back of your Bible, if you've never been there. Jerusalem is down here, Jordan River, Galilee up here, Sea of Galilee. And this territory in between was called Samaria. Now, there was a city called Samaria, but he's referring to the territory here. So as you traveled from Jerusalem back up to Galilee, some would actually go outside on the east side of the Jordan River so that they wouldn't travel to, through Samaritan territory. Well, why? Who are the Samaritans? They're kind of an interesting story, really. Ethnically, the best way that we understand, and that none of this can be 100% certain, but the best way we understand the Samaritans is that they were ethnically mixed. They were the leftovers from the northern ten tribes when when the Assyrians conquered them and then intermarried. They forcibly intermarried them so that the, from an, a political policy, that meant that their ethnic distinctiveness was disrupted and it, it, it discouraged further revolts in their empire. So that's who the Samaritans were. Now, religiously, so they were, they were kind of, they have Israelite roots. 
Religiously, they held to part of the Old Testament. Not all of it, but part of it. Uh, And then they set up a, a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. Now, Mount Gerizim was by the city of Shechem. Shechem was an ancient site, uh, has lots of important, uh, lots of biblical history happens at the site of Shechem. It's the first place that's mentioned when Abram enters the land of Canaan. It says he sets up an altar there and worships Yahweh in Canaan, signifying that this territory is now claimed for Yahweh. Happened first at Shechem. Joshua chapter 8, Joshua brings the people into the land and they renew the covenant and they stand at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim in the valley in between and they recite the curses and blessings. It's in Joshua chapter 8, happened at Shechem. A lot happens here, but none of that is mentioned. So a historical reader would have heard this, somebody, somebody from this period would have heard it say, oh, I know that territory. All the history kind of comes crashing in on their mind. The gospel writer here doesn't mention any of that. He mentions a well. Of course, Jacob was famous, the patriarch Jacob. And this well is never mentioned in Scripture, but the place is well known and you can still go there to this day. It's outside the modern city of Nablus in the West Bank of Israel. You can go and you can still drink from this well uh, if you can get the tour guide to take you there. I think there's a church over the site. So this is where they're at. He doesn't frame it up in terms of all of this history though. He frames it up in terms of this well. Jesus meets a woman at a well. Now, if you're familiar with biblical history, That should make you sit up in your seat just a little bit and pay attention. There's some very significant meetings that happen at wells. Specifically, the patriarchs, Isaac and Jacob, both meet their wives at wells, as did the prophet Moses. So important meetings at wells have happened. And that invites us to kind of It's one of those little hints for the narrator to draw us into the story. Time frame, it's about noon. And Jesus and his disciples have been walking maybe about six hours. And so he rests by the well as the disciples head off into town to find them some lunch. That's our setting. Let's pick it up in verse 7. So a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty Or have to come here to draw water. So we are far removed from this practice, graciously. But you would have drawn your water probably early in the morning or later in the evening, not out in the hot of the day. You get your water first thing in the day so that you have it to do all your cooking and whatever it is you would need it used for at home. You stock up in the morning, but you go out when it's cool, not, not out in the heat. And so... It looks like she comes here at noon intentionally to be alone. And so Jesus, sitting there, asks her for a drink. And his question catches her off guard. So she's a woman. And men didn't usually talk to women if they didn't know them. uh, Especially 
in public, especially strangers, especially alone. She observes to him, well, I'm a Samaritan. Why are you talking to me? Why are you talking to me? So they're worse than Gentiles. The Samaritans are worse than Gentiles, not just because they're worshiping other gods, but they take the worship of God and they pervert it. They took the worship of Yahweh, they only took part of the book, and they put up a rival temple, and they included some elements of paganism with it. So to to the Jews, the Samaritans were worse than the Gentiles. And she knows that. She says, why are you talking to me? Why are you asking me? And John adds, for the sake of us centuries later, who aren't familiar with all of the backstory, just so you know, Jews and Samaritans don't have anything to do with each other. Just, just in case you couldn't catch the tension already, let me just double down and make sure you get that. So they have nothing to do with one another except Jesus asks her for a drink. From her jar. That crosses all kinds of boundaries. There's a male-female boundary here. There's a religious boundary here. He's respectable, and as we'll see shortly, she's not. They're both unmarried, as we'll see shortly. And drinking from her jar as a Samaritan would have made him unclean. Jesus is taking all of those social conventions, he's plowing right through them, just in asking for a drink. She's totally caught off guard by him even addressing her, much less asking for a drink from her jar. And so she points this out, and his response throws another curve, and it shifts the conversation entirely. He says, if you only knew, verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's asking you, well, you would have asked him. If you only knew. Now, for us, when we load a conversation uh, on the front end with that kind of statement, that's condescending, right? Not if you're the son of God, though. If you only knew. Think about that. The question is inviting her to ask a question. It's, it's probing her mind to awaken her to say, well, who is this in front of me? Maybe... Maybe I should be thinking about this differently. Maybe this situation isn't as I see it is uh, in front of me. He's probing, he's inviting her to ask a question. And the gift of God he's speaking about is also inviting. Who doesn't like free stuff? Especially if it's from God. And in this case, the gift and the giver are the same. Jesus is the giver and the gift. The living water. If you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. Jesus is the living water. It's a metaphor for having life in him. Now, that's an image, that's a, that's a phrase that's used other places in the Bible. One of the chief references you maybe are familiar with. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. God, through the prophet, is recounting to the Israelites their shortcomings. He says, my, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Again, we're far removed from this practice today, but in an ancient city, a cistern would be a kind of place where rainwater collected and it would be a source of water for you. A broken cistern obviously leaked. It was no good. Jesus is laying out for her a biblical reference. You would have asked him. He would have given you living water. You're relying on broken cisterns. And her incredulous response is really priceless. Verse 12. Did you catch this? this is the first time we read it? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank for him himself, as did his sons and livestock. 
it would be fun to just know Jesus' internal response at this moment. Are you greater than our father Jacob? The, that, that's, that's irony right there. That's, that's beautiful storytelling, okay? The Greek text actually is a little stronger. It starts out with the negative. It would, it would be stated this way. You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? She also calls Jacob our father, referring to herself and the Samaritans. Jesus lets that one lay for the moment. And then he draws contrast between the well water and the living water. He says, this, this water, this is plain water. It leaves you thirsty again. But the water that I'll give him, he'll never thirst again. And so this unnamed woman is piqued at this moment. So, oh, really? Water that doesn't make you thirsty? Well, that sounds good. You can almost hear kind of sarcasm in her voice. Oh, really? Well, that sounds great. How are you going to do that? You know? And then Jesus turns the polite conversation on its head. Look at verse 16 and follow it. So 15, she says, well, yeah, that sounds great. Give me this water. Yeah, I'd like to have that. How are you going to pull this off? Verse 16. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our father is worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming, when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship that what we know for salvation is from the Jews but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such people to worship him God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth and the woman said to him I know that Messiah is coming he who is called Christ and when he comes he will tell us all things and Jesus said to her I who speak to you Am he. So he tells her, well, yeah, but that water sounds great. I'd like that. He says, okay, well, go call your husband and come here. Which could be a standard form of saying, let's make a financial transaction, some kind of deal, and well, and, you know, the head of the home would have had to be involved. And so Jesus, all right, we'll go get your husband. And she responds, I have no husband. I would love to be able to hear the tone of voice in her response. She cuts through layers and layers of fog here. She's living in immorality. But that in itself is just a symptom. Her central problem, she's empty and thirsty. And now she's exposed. I would love to hear her tone of voice. Is it resigned? I have no husband. Is it defiant? I have no husband. Is it Indicating to him that she's available? We don't know. It's hard to know exactly the meaning she's trying to communicate to him. We see here in her response that she has a faith in God. If a bit mixed up. So she's interested, at least curious, in what Jesus is talking about. But there's some obstacles that have to be dealt with first. Oh, sure, give me this water. Something has to be dealt with first. Sure, I'd like this living water. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Well, go call your husband and let's get this stuff dealt with. You see, Jesus isn't something we just add to our our already full life. 
we have to come clean and deal with some of those things first. And so he confronts what's in her way. Sometimes we have to confront the things in our life that compete for allegiance. Jesus must trump all other loyalties. And we need to figure out that the cisterns we're relying on are broken. That's where she's at. And so I have no husband. To her short, direct confession, Jesus says, you're right. You could kind of hear her mentally back up, like, okay, this went someplace I didn't think it was going. You're right. And he proceeds to unpack for her all of her domestic failures. She's been married and divorced five times. And now she's living with a man that's not her husband. In our culture, we would be inclined to see this as her doing, her choices. She's initiated this. In their culture, it's almost certain that these divorces were initiated by the men. Which means that her five divorces are five epic rejections. Hearing it recounted back to her had to sting. It had to hurt to face it. As readers, I think we can feel just a tinge of embarrassment for her even these many years later. So she does what I think most of us would do in that moment, and that's change the subject. Look at verse 19. Well, sir, I, I could see that you're a prophet. Uh, and so our fathers, I have a question for you. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but your fathers say, well, you worship on that mountain. And uh, this is the place. She just kind of throws out religious debate. Some of you maybe have ever had this experience. You're trying to share Christ with someone, and the person has no idea really what the claims of the gospel are, but all of a sudden they want to debate the end times or something clear off here in the smoke screen, you know. That's a well-worn human tactic. So she redirects. Her redirection isn't exactly a denial or an admission either. She moves to religious territory, which feels safer than talking about personal sin. But he doesn't let her shift the focus, and he end runs the whole discussion. It's not in this place. Not Mount Gerizim, which they would have been right below. Not the Samaritan temple. It's not in this place or in Jerusalem. So that's the most critical element in worshiping God. Now, he doesn't deny that Jerusalem is the proper temple, but he, doesn't, he just doesn't end run on the, on the whole thing. That isn't the most critical element. The most critical element in worshiping God is that we come to him in spirit and in truth. God wants worshipers who come in spirit and in truth. And so he's inviting her to totally break her categories, to think outside of the conceptions that she has placed on the world. It's an invitation, and she doesn't, she doesn't really bite on that invitation. She just says this. Oh, I know that the Messiah is coming. So there's a faith here in her. She understands something of the Hebrew God, and she understands that there's a promised one. Now, the Samaritan understandings of what the Messiah would be would mainly that he would be a teacher, and you can see that come through here. Well, I know that the Messiah is coming, and he's going to clear it all up. I have no idea what you just tried to tell me, but I know that the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to give us the straight scoop. And then he drops the bomb. I'm him. Now let your eyes jump back for a moment to verse 12. And hear her sarcastic comment to him. Are you better than our father Jacob? You think? To hear the irony come through the author here? 
Yes, I'm the promised one. Before Abraham was, I am. He lays this out there. She meant it as a rhetorical question, not having any idea how correct she was. She, it displays how lost she is, but she's in the process of finding grace here. She's finding grace. And then the disciples walk in and interrupt this whole event. It's a little bit comical. Verse 27, and the disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, well, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away to town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went, up the, they went out of the town and were coming to him. So the disciples come back, and they're, just, they're surprised that he's talking to a woman, which really they would have thought somewhat scandalous, uh, at minimum questionable, certainly not for respectable people. Again, there's Samaritan, Israelite boundaries being crossed here, but he's a man, he's a respectable rabbi, she's, we have no idea who she is, you know, out here in the middle of the day by herself, you just, you just didn't have those kind of conversations. Jesus blows all of that up, and they walk in on that, and they watch it happening, and the conversation at this point is cut off, and so she heads back off to town forgetting her water jar, the whole reason she came. Experiencing grace can do that to a person. It reorients priorities. So she runs back to town and she starts pointing people to Jesus. Come see a man who told me all I ever did. Look how she goes about it though. She went out to the well hiding. Now she's drawing attention back to herself. The heart of her testimony, the heart of what she's sharing with people is how Jesus spoke to her broken, messy situation. Something really significant has happened to her and the people respond in droves. It says that the whole town went out and were coming to him. So what do we take from this? The one application is obvious. One application is obvious, and that's Jesus welcomes broken people. This woman is broken, and Jesus welcomes her. That's obvious, but how strongly the point is made, you might find somewhat shocking. Let me try to unpack it. He doesn't just accept her and welcome her. He initiates to her. Jesus is the one that started this conversation. Jesus reached out to her, broke through all of these boundaries. And it was inappropriate for him to do so. And taking a drink from her jar would have made him unclean. All of these barriers, this is a really big deal. So Jesus is breaking all of these barriers. Male, female, religious, ethnic. He's social convention, he's, he's busting through all of that. The, the dietary laws, the unclean, he's, he's busting through all of that. But there's more. There's a much, much deeper level of how significant Jesus reaching out to her is. This happens at a well. In the biblical story, Meetings at wells lead to weddings. Genesis 24, Abraham's servant meets Rebekah for Isaac. Genesis 29, Jacob meets Rachel. And in Exodus chapter 2, Moses meets his wife, Zipporah. There's layers to this text. There's a historical element, and then, then there's... The textual element where the, the story is enacting a parable for us. Meetings at wells lead to weddings. 
This is Jesus' bride. She's unnamed because she's us. Now, in the original audience, they would have seen her as unnamed because she's the typical Samaritan. Five husbands and a live-in, this is what you get with Samaritans. It's bigger than that, though. This is us. She's unnamed because she stands for all of us at church. We've all had at least five husbands. Idols that we've clung to instead of Christ. We're all thirsty for soul healing. And until we find it, we cycle through hobbies, pleasures, escapes in substances, relationships, and even marriages. We cycle through all of those things. And the pain of the gospel is having the light shone on them. And the healing of the gospel, the living water, is to realize it's now safe and okay. Even to the point that we go and tell others, rejoicing in what was once shameful. This woman, shameful and shame-filled, meets Jesus at a well. She's all of us. In the biblical story, wells lead to weddings. Now, hear me clearly. Jesus doesn't do anything inappropriate here. There's not a real relationship between these two people. The writer is using her life to be a picture, a parable of ours. This was why Jesus never married in his earthly life. We are his bride. Jesus' bride, his church, looks like this woman. We've all had five husbands. And five might be charitable. But by his grace, we now have one. By his grace, we have one. Let that sink in. Let's savor it. Just soak it in and love it. All of the idols that we have clung to and maybe still cling to in our lives, some of them respectable and some very much unrespectable. We've had five husbands and now we have one. By God's grace, just savor that. Just take that and rejoice in it. If you... Make that application, that's enough. Just rejoice that God has made us whole and taken us to be his bride. Savor that. And I want you to know one more thing. There's one more layer to this. I'm just going to summarize verses 31 through 42. So It says that, She went back and brought out the village and many of them came to believe in Jesus. Uh, And it says not just because of what she said, but eventually because of what Jesus said. And so we're given the idea that their faith isn't just sort of a tangential thing, but it's their own, it's owned. But I want you to note 35. So as all these people are coming out, the disciples are kind of, they're still confused. I think I would be with them most of the time. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, verse 35, look at this. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. This whole town at this point is coming out to see Jesus. And Jesus says, look at guys. There are fields. There are people. 
who do not know that they can have living water. In fact, they do not yet know they need it. These people were awakened to their need by this unnamed woman who had found grace. Church, this is the words of Jesus. Lift up your eyes and see the fields. Lift up your eyes and see the fields. We are surrounded by people who need grace. They are thirsty and they know not what for. And we have the answer. Now hear me clearly. Please hear me on this. This is not a guilt trip to go do evangelism. There is no guilt here. If you leave guilty, either I've failed or you failed or we've both failed or something. I don't want anyone to walk out of here feeling guilty. You see, Jesus died to remove guilt, so we're not trying to add it back to it. Sometimes we add guilt because we think that makes us feel better. Well, I know I've been given a lot, so at least if I feel bad about it, then I can feel okay about receiving it. There's no guilt here. We're not shooting for guilt. If we know grace, it should give us some urgency, but not from guilt. It should give us urgency because of joy. If you have experienced grace and been set free from your idols, does it give you joy? Then we should go tell the whole town. That sounds a little daunting, though. So I want you to start with a smaller goal. If you tell the whole town, that's great. I'm not going to stop you. But set a goal in your mind, maybe for two. So I'm going to put two people on my list. If you don't already have people you're praying for and trying to witness to, let this be a simple strategy. Pick two people. I want you to, two people that you interact with, have a relationship with, uh, and I want you to start praying for opportunities to share with them. I want you to share those two names with a friend from church and invite one another to pray together and say, how can we do this together? Tell someone. Make it intentional. Make a plan and go for it. Put some intentionality to it and take a risk. Because there are people who need grace. People who are thirsty. And we have water. Water not like the well water. Living water. You see, we've got a story that people want to hear. We go to sharing Christ often. We think people aren't interested. They're going to be angry. Most people are not angry. Believe me, I've met a lot of people who are very disinterested. But no one's angry. And when they see the living water and when God opens their eyes, we will have the joy of knowing that we were a part of that and God used us for that. Savor it. Share it. Let me pray for us. And Logan's going to come and lead us our end's closing song. God, we are your people, chosen by your grace and your intentional plan to bless us in spite of who we are and what we deserve. You've given us grace and rescued us from our idols. Lord, let us know it. Let us see it. Give us eyes of faith to behold what you've truly done for us. And to simply let that be our joy all our days on this short earth. That we might bring others into your kingdom forever with us. Give us this grace we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.